Welcome everyone. Glad to see you on my channel. Today I will tell you about an unusual story. An amazing story about companionship and love. I wish you a pleasant audience. Angelique never opened her back. There were no things in her closet that could expose the delicate, milky white skin between her left shoulder blade and her lower back. Max had only learned about what Angelica was hiding after the wedding on the first wedding night. Then the puffy, eerie dress seemingly woven from clouds and morning dew slipped down to reveal his beloved's loins when he finished untying the laces. And he saw it, a long, sickly pink scar snaked downward, as if some nightmarish monster had clawed at the girl's back. Max froze, shocked by the sight. The newlywed also froze, but her raised body language, her tense shoulders, and her head bowed in doom gave away the fact that she was afraid of question. And Max didn't ask anything. Instead, walked around her, stood in front of her, gently took her chin, lifting it to meet her gaze, and said the most important words, I love you. You are my most beautiful. I will always be with you. You are my destiny. Since then, a whole 15 years of marriage have passed. In it, after a year, a daughter, Sarah, was born. In it was enough different moments happy when it seemed the whole world at their disposal and sad, heavy, which seemed to will fate, tested the strength of their union, tested whether these people are ready to stay together no matter what. Angelica and Max Stone lived in a small town that had grown up on the shore comparatively recently in the late 70s. It was a small town of the sort where the atmosphere is capable of not changing for decades. There were many architectural monuments, shady streets with acacia and cherry trees, only one shopping center, but six markets and two cinemas, the smaller of which to the surprise of economic experts. If they, of course, one day suddenly decided to pay attention to it, survived not by showing Hollywood blockbusters, but by renting retro pictures, Max's family belonged to the old-timers of the town. Angelica's family, consisting only of her and Sophia's mom, moved here when the girl was barely nine years old. Daughter Sarah grew up smart. Parents adored her. However, now that she entered the wonderful age of adolescence, enough and worries Sarah suddenly began to show character and as condescendingly said about her behavior class teacher. Behave like a typical modern teenager, in other words. Sarah was stubborn, argued sometimes with relatives just for the sake of arguing and friends with not those with whom they approved. In principle, she did not drive with very dysfunctional youth, but here is a friend, Richard, who was two years older than Sarah. Her parents were very alarmed because he was, as they thought, strange, dressed in all black hung out with the same gloomy young personalities, wrote dreary poems and was fond of rock, even managed to give a few small concerts in the clubs of the city with his band Midnight Tigers. Richard was from a single parent family and was raised by his grandfather from the age of 12 after his parents died in a car accident. Angelica never tired of repeating to Max that it was probably because of Richard. Their daughter so loved the color black is fond of gothic fiction novels and even tries to sing novels and even tries to sing. However, the latter the girl was very good. Angelica and Max believed that their marriage was a great success and the meeting was just a gift from above. They were just happy to live their small, cozy family life. But then everything changed. One morning, when the weather was so sunny and warm that it was impossible to believe that it was already October on the calendar, Everyone in the Stone family was going about their business. Sarah had gone to school. Angelica had gone to work. And Max had lost some papers he needed among the mess on the table, which, by the way, the day before he himself had made. When the doorbell rang, he thought it was probably Selina, the neighbor who had borrowed him bread from them the other day because the store at home had run out of bread, and he needed something to eat for dinner. So I figured she must have been the one who dropped off the baked goods. What happened? Max asked when Angelica showed up on the doorstep. She was white as a sheet, about to faint, and the neighbor supported her so that she did not fall. 
He answered for the woman who could only moan muffledly through clenched teeth. Maxie's gaze instinctively swept over Angelica's body, searching for the damage, and it was found down below. Her left leg badly injured, and the pant leg of her jeans ripped and wet. Brand new. I was so excited when I bought them. It's youthful cowboy embroidery. The background, inappropriate thoughts, ran through my head as Max intercepted his wife from his neighbor's arms and sat her down on a banquette in the hallway. Everything will be all right. Hold on. I'll call an ambulance. Turn to his wife. Already sighed Walker and took off his cap, which he wore all year round, except for the most severe frosts. Scratch the back of his head. We walk to the bus stop together through our yard. And there it is, you know, in what condition the road. And she took it and flew into a hole. It's not deep, but you can twist your leg. And here it is. It's even worse. That tin can. Damn it. Where did it come from? Maybe a spare part. The garages are nearby. Probably one of the guys lost it or threw it away. Under the conversation of the neighbor, Max sat down next to his wife and carefully, afraid to cause more pain, examined the leg. I'll have to get stitches, but it seems that everything is not so terrible. It could be worse. The scar would certainly remain, or would it? A plastic surgeon could probably do something with a fresh one, and there would be money for it. Max nodded to his thoughts. He would not let Angelica lose the beauty of such legs. His wife was, is, and will be the most beautiful. One scar was enough for her. The one they never talked about. The ambulance came quickly. Max thanked his neighbor for his participation and, of course, said he would go with his wife. At work, of course, did not go to work. And fortunately, the boss took the situation with understanding, only said that the day after tomorrow you need very desirable or the project will stand. Max really hoped that Angelica would be better by tomorrow. They returned from the hospital in the afternoon. Angelica asked her husband not to tear Sarah out of school, not to scare her out of school, not to scare her, let her find out everything better when she got home. I wanted to go to the market to get some peppers for Lecho, Angelica grinned as her husband made her comfortable in bed. The painkillers had worked well and now the woman wanted to sleep alone. Except her body wanted to sleep while in her mind something dark was rising from the depths, thick and murky like swamp sludge. It kept rising and hinting to her to go to sleep. Then we'll remember something, baby. Something you want so badly, but you can't forget. The peppers won't run away. Max smiled and kissed his wife on the nose. We'll buy more, and you'll make your specialty leko. That's it. Rest. Are you hungry? Shall I make macaroni and cheese? Or shall we order a pizza? I'm not hungry yet. Pizza it is. It'll stand, and when you're hungry. Max, I caught him by the arm, grabbing his wrist. I'm scared. Baby, it's over. Remember what the doctor said. The wound has been treated properly. Antibiotics have been prescribed. You don't have to be afraid. Soon you'll be walking again, even running and dancing. And if you're worried about the scar, then... About the scar? Angelica interrupted him. I was so scared today. You know, I've been lucky for all these years. I didn't break anything. Everything was normal. No injuries. I can't. I have to tell you. Tell me what, baby. Max sat on the edge of the bed and soothingly stroked his wife's arm. The scar on her back. You never asked where it came from, because I knew you wouldn't want to talk about it. I was just respecting your privacy and the part of your past that isn't for me. But that's okay, he hastily added at the end. We've been in love for so many years and it doesn't matter. Believe me, you don't have to tell me anything. But I want to. Angelica was breathing frequently, her eyes glittering feverishly. I haven't told anyone about this. I mean, since Mom and I moved to this town to start over, 
we had to move. Max listened in silence. Angelica knew him very well. But even she couldn't have realized what he was feeling. What a palette of feelings and memories were unfolding in him as she spoke. Because he knew how to control himself, had to learn. To survive in a world that had once torn itself to pieces, threatening to destroy, to trample, to not allow one to simply exist as the most ordinary human being. Back then, she and her mom lived in a different big and noisy city. Sophia was a single mom. A very young girl, she came from the village to study in the city, not wanting to repeat the fate of parents who preferred hot drinks to the only daughter. It was here at the university and love happened. The first scalding. An unfortunate young man who was about to receive a diploma, as it turned out, only played in love with a pretty provincial girl, and then cruelly cut off all her hopes, said that it was time for him to go home, on the other side of the country, where his parents had already chosen him a good bride. Sophia was shattered by this betrayal, and only the fact that she would have a child helped her to hold on. Of course, it was not easy for the yesterday student with the baby in her arms, but a good education helped. After graduating from the university, Sophia began to teach German in a private gymnasium, a language she not only knew, but adored. In fact, the German language was the only link that connected her with her distant ancestors who came from Germany in the late 19th century. Lived mother and daughter in a rented room in a communal apartment, but was lucky with the neighbors who were quiet, intelligent people. Angelica grew up smart, restless, laughing girl. And more than anything else in the world, she loved apple pies and fairy tales. Her mother often brought her new books from the city library. It was there that she met Sam. They just bumped into each other at the bookshelves. He took some books on folklore, and she was looking for some collection of fairy tales, which would be unknown to her daughter, word for word. Sam offered to continue their acquaintance, but Sophia refused. She didn't need any relationship. She lived with her daughter and was happy with it. But even those few words spoken in the library, those few unintentional glances, they were enough for Sam to choose a target. Because he had been walking around the city for a long time and looking closely, believing that his special, as he himself believed inherited by hunters, instinct would help him find his prey. The doors to the nightmare opened on a sunny August day when Angelica was returning from school. In general, it was one of the main advantages of the gymnasium, where Sophia taught that the children of teachers could study there for free. And almost always Sophia took her daughter from the last lesson, took her home. But on this day, Sophia was called to her principal, needed to discuss something about the progress of the class. Angelica asked to go home alone. She said that she was already big and could cross the road on the Zanzella guy, then pass the yard and wait for her mother on the bench at the entrance especially since in her briefcase was waiting for a new book of fairy tales, which she took to read from it. Classmate exchanged, by the way, were as many as four stickers with goldfish. The little girl froze at the traffic light. Nearby, workers were crushing the old asphalt. Angelica was frightened. What if small stones flew at her too? Everything was humming so terribly. Then a minibus arrived and the girl was almost carried away by the passengers rushing into it. Then some drunken citizen quarreled with another drunken type, and Angelica was completely frightened, almost burst into tears. Crossing the road now seemed just an impossible task, and the girl decided to go around, that is, to cross at another traffic light, and for this it was necessary to pass one yard, go through a narrow and for some reason dark, even in a clear day, arch. But Angelica remembered that the monsters live only in fairy tales and so fearlessly chose a new route. And then everything as quickly happened. Just suddenly in the arch she met a man, he asked. Baby, did you drop this? And twirled something in his hand. Angelica was scared again. Did she drop her keys? Or a new keychain with a pink pig in a striped cap? She went to check both in the pocket of her dress and the strange man had enough of it. 
He suddenly, in one leap, as it seemed to her, was next to her, grinned fearfully and pressed something to her face. Angelica wanted to breathe, to scream, but instead fell into darkness. Much later, looking back on the time she spent in the lair of the madmen, Angelica realized that it was normal that six days merged for a child in eternity, a dark eternity, illuminated by flashes of wild pain and hot, wrenching fear. That it was normal that over time the details merged into a kaleidoscope of horror, that some of them faded like faded photocards, but others became brighter and sharper, so that it seemed to try, dare to return to them in imagination, and they would cut you like red. The little girl was unable to understand what the maniac really wanted from her. It was only when she became a teenager that Angelica ventured once to delve into the essence of what happened and her mother, though it was very hard, told her all the details of the past. This partly helped to understand why the madman needed her, but it didn't help her let go of the past. Angelica could only sort of lock it away in a far corner of her memory, mind, consciousness just decided one day it wasn't a part of her life anymore. It is not, of course. She still went to psychologists, but after 30 years left this idea. The final visit was to a specialist who insisted that one should let go of the past through forgiveness. Then Angelica screamed and threw everything at the walls and then just fell to the floor and sobbed. She didn't understand. How could she forgive? What that monster was doing to her. That little brat. Admit it. Have you turned into a wolf before? The man in black said to her and hurt her. Little witch. Werewolf. Damn shifter. How many people have you and your mother killed? Answer me. Those who came to rescue the little girl were shocked. The maniac's lair was like a medieval cellar. Have you heard about the witch hunts in Franconia? Angelica asked her husband in a muffled, colorless voice. Yes. Max felt as if the air in the room had run out so unbearably painful pressure in his chest. He wanted to. He didn't know himself. Perhaps it would be easier to cease to exist in an instant. Only, alas, reality held a tenacious grip. And then there was his love for this woman. 16th century German principalities... Mass executions of people accused of being werewolves, witches, and sorcerers. Angelica looked up. She had amazing eyes. Brown with amber, red sparkles scattered across the iris. Max always thought they were the warmest, most affectionate eyes in the world. He was looking for someone like me. He wanted to find a girl whose ancestors were German. But he wasn't just looking for a girl. He believed he was looking for the descendants of those who had been werewolves then, centuries ago, but had escaped punishment. He told me, me. Angelica squirmed on the bed, sitting up, pulled her knees up and wrapped her arms around them, rested her chin on top and sighed deeply, convulsively. He said that when my mother told him that she taught him German, that our last name was Schwartz, passed down from our ancestors. He said that's when his third eye opened, that he could see that my mom had a wolf's head, and he thought I was the same. He wanted me to confess. Then he could save me, but he wanted to kill me. Angelica said the last words with frightening calm. He wanted to save me from the werewolf curse before I started attacking livestock and people. He said he would save me. But to do that, I had to confess. Then it was over. Angelica told her husband that when the maniac was captured, of course, there was a loud trial. Journalists savored the details and made up nicknames for him. The Inquisitor, Werewolf Hunter. It was said that he might have had more victims. But the forensics showed that Sam was mentally ill. Doctors said he made up the dozens of witches and werewolves he executed. In the end, everyone assured Sophia that she and her daughter had nothing more to fear. Sam's diagnosis was so severe and complex that he was never meant to be released. Did he leave that scar? Max asked. He was no longer touching his wife. The man's fingers clenched the blanket around her legs. Yes, 
Angelica nodded. The day I was rescued, I'd already confess everything. Said I was a werewolf. I was a child, you know. He promised that it would be over. That I wouldn't be her anymore. That my mom and I would be together. I know now I know what he meant. He wanted her too. Us together. Angelica pressed her palms to her face and sobbed. He promised that it wouldn't hurt. And it hurt so much again, he kept asking. And when I couldn't answer the way I needed to, he made it up himself and just told me to say yes. And then he decided to test me turning into a wolf. He said iron would reveal my essence. He took something iron and stop it. Max rushed to his wife, hugging her so suddenly and tightly, clutching her, pulling her down on the bed, pressing himself against her that she cried out but stopped crying at the same time. It was as if something in her head had clicked and shut off the ability to shed tears. Angelica looked at her husband. His face was so close she could feel his hot breath. It's all in the past, Max said. He's locked up. Consider him gone, and you're alive. You've grown up. You're my wife. You belong to me. Not what happened to you. You must forget and move on. For me, for Sarah, for us. Tell me what I can do to make you let it go. I don't know, Angelica whispered, her fingertips sliding over his face, tracing the familiar native features. I just... Today, when I hurt myself... I realize that it still lives in me. It's like a part of me is still in that basement. It's gone. The past we need to run from is gone, Max said. And Angelica believed him, gathered the rest of her strength, her courage, her hope, and believed him. Now, when the truth was revealed and the beloved man did not recoil as if from the plague, she was greatly relieved. When that process was over, she and her mother were forced to leave. Yes. Most people saw her as just an innocent victim, just a child who fell prey to a maniac. She was pitied, but soon her mom packed her bags and quit school. Sophia did not like the fact that some journalists, disregarding all the norms of their professional ethics, are eager to learn the gruesome details of their first-hand experience. They promised big money for an interview with a little girl. And maybe you can tell us what was going on in the basement what he was doing to the girl. You, as a mother, should know everything. When some guy with glasses stuck his foot in the doorway, preventing Sophia from locking herself out of the house when she got home from work and tried to break in like that, she knew she had to move. And it wasn't just the press, by the way. Angelica couldn't go to school in peace anymore. One of the seniors made a cruel joke that maybe the little girl really is a witch. It was not for nothing that the teacher who had recently given her a D had suddenly fallen ill with a cold. But at least here, they didn't talk about the story on every corner. Sophia only wanted her daughter to have a normal childhood. Angelica graduated from school, but did not go to university. She studied to be an accountant and got a job at a factory that produced TV sets. And then a new blow of fate fell on the small family Sophia was diagnosed with cancer. The last stage doctors. Doctors spread their hands and said that the patient just did not pay attention to the early symptoms. Angelica more than one year corrupted herself for the fact that it, worrying about her, her mother launched herself. It was in that difficult period of life the girl met Max. It was a romantic acquaintance together, came to the ballet, sat in neighboring seats, and at intermission, when they went to the buffet, he gave her the last eclair with custard. Then there was a long candy bouquet period. Angelica sparingly told about herself, and as she confessed after Max had made an offer, she was afraid that nobody would love such a bouquet at all. But Max loved her, and said then more than once that it was fate, that at first sight it was clear here. Here is the woman with whom he just has to spend time for the rest of his life. Max lived with his Aunt Ariana. His mother died in childbirth, and his father, as he said, never knew what. Mother's sister raised the boy as a native son and jealously regarded all his hobbies. But here Angelica approved immediately. She came to her liking modesty, good upbringing, and 
some kind of girl's lack of modernity, career ambitions, the desire to be fashionable and the most stylish. It wasn't about Angelica. She just, just existed as if in her own little world, and that was charming. Angelica not only fell in love with Max, but in many ways felt his soulmate. After all, he too, in fact, was a loner. Only Aunt Ariana, Auntie, by the way, still lived in the same small house on the outskirts of the city, where Max grew up and sometimes on weekends the couple visited her. Max and Angelica lived in a relatively new neighborhood in the center of the city ten years ago. Thanks to her husband's good earnings, managed to buy an apartment here and very quickly pay off the mortgage visits to Ariana always left the most pleasant impressions in the house of the one who replaced Max's birth mother, was always clean and cozy. The interior was lavishly decorated with crocheted napkins Ariana loved to do needlework. She also baked amazingly delicious pies made with Kalina or sea buckthorn. She always called Angelica Sweetie or Baby, spoiled Sarah, and knew a thousand and one funny stories about Max's childhood. Often, Auntie sat Angelica next to her on the old plush sofa and opened on her lap a heavy, huge photo album full of different pictures, and about each one she could remember some curious case. That day, when Angelica hurt her leg, they ordered pizza. They ate it, drank unhealthy but tasty soda with fruit flavor, and watched some silly comedy. In the evening, of course, they told Sarah everything and treated her to pizzas. The next day, Max went to work, but told his wife not to be shy, and if anything, immediately call him. And also be sure to rest. Do not grumble that you will have to lean on a crutch for a while when walking and in general keep a positive attitude. Kevin was also a builder, his right-hand man in the project of repairing the roof of a country cottage. And now you've gone into your own head. If you mess up, the roof will collapse on our heads. Or the owners. Leave him alone. Another worker passing by with empty bags for construction waste, interceded sternly, but without malice. A man's wife almost killed herself. But she didn't. Kevin waved his hand in the air. Pull yourself together, you're a man. Max agreed that he had to pull himself together. But it wasn't so easy. And it wasn't just because Angelica had hurt herself. It wasn't even that at all. It was just that yesterday he'd learned something that had turned his life upside down. Something that had torn the usual reality to shreds. And Max wasn't sure that it could be restored. As soon as he closed his eyes, memories came to him. It was a winter day. I think it was February. Auntie was baking pies. The last jar of jam had been opened. He, Max, a boy of about four years old, was playing with a soft wolf. It's a very old toy, repaired many times, but it's the most valuable for him. He wouldn't trade it for a truckload of chocolates. Suddenly, there is a knock at the window. Max looks up and sees someone's silhouette behind the glass in the thickening dusk. He can't make out who it is, the frosty pattern hiding the window, but the boy had already guessed. He jumps up, shouts, cheering, and runs to the kitchen to get his aunt to open the door. She doesn't immediately understand what he wants, and when she does, her face darkens. Nervously, she shakes off the flower on her apron and goes into the hallway. A frosty chill flies in through the doorway, even though the guest had first gone through the other doors, in the part of the house that is the hall. Max squeals again and throws himself on his neck. He doesn't care that the visitor is cold, and his beard is prickly and frosty. The man grins, growls jokingly, and tosses him high, then catches him and tosses him again. What do you want? Auntie asks glumly. It's nothing. I was passing by. Let me, I think, check how you are here. Much later, Max learned from his aunt that Sam's visits were never accidental, spontaneous. No, he came only when he planned it, and even kept a schedule of at least three, but not more than four times a year. And he never came in April or May because Max was born on the border of those months. When Max grew up and asked why that was, 
His aunt said it was because Sam had once been a close friend of his mother Leslie, and that's why it's hard for Sam to show up at their house at this time. But when Max turned 14, his aunt revealed the real truth, that Sam was not a friend of the family, but his father. Auntie tried to arrange everything so that he would remember the party. A huge cake, lots of other goodies. He invited all his friends, and Ariana allowed the young people to listen to music loudly, and herself, to avoid embarrassment, left the house until the evening, asking only one thing to leave a piece of cake for her. Max must have been impressed by the party for a week, and then. Auntie said that they needed to have a serious talk, that he was a big boy. He even got a passport. He's a grown-up and has the right to know the truth. Ariana admitted that she was afraid that if Max learned the truth from another person, it could have unpredictable consequences. The boy sat down next to her, not understanding anything. What truth? Auntie told her story from afar. It turned out that Max's mother was an extraordinary woman. She dreamed of getting a job in the capital, and as soon as she became of age, she went to conquer the big city. She left this small town where her sister was. Ariana and Leslie were left early without parents. They left one by one from severe illnesses. Ariana did not have such ambitions as her sister. She liked to work as a saleswoman in the local store, and she did not want more. Leslie fulfilled her dream and entered the university, the Faculty of Foreign Languages. She wanted to become a translator and travel the world and it so happened that she chose German as her main language. And also, she was excellent at Latin. Practice decided to pass in one publishing house who was just preparing to release a book on the history of Germany in the late Middle Ages. And Leslie also worked part-time in his free time from school because one scholarship for a young girl who wants to taste life in all its manifestations, of course, was not enough. There, in one cafe, the influx of visitors which usually came to the evenings, Leslie and met a man. He was not like an ordinary guest, ordered only non-alcoholic beverages, held himself as a bit stiff, talked, and it turned out that he... Yes, in fact, especially about himself, this man did not like to talk. He only said that he worked as a private tour guide, which is not safe, but officially this position is not taken. And here he came to study the local public to penetrate into the essence of vice. He said that he himself came from a remote village, but it did not work out, not accepted the big city. He lives quietly. He works at whatever job he can get, trying to understand how the world works, where and why everyone is in a hurry. Leslie thought he was funny. It was a short and strange novel. Sam, which was the name of the new acquaintance, said all the time that he was not a family man at all. Sometimes he joked that she had bewitched him. When Leslie was free, they walked around the city and how much Sam knew about him. But the girl was confused by the fact that he always emphasized the darkest things. Here, for example, in such and such a year, there was an execution of those accused of witchcraft. And here, they say, in the 18th century, they held black masses. Sam never tired of repeating how badly the modern world works. He said that evil under the masks of ordinary people penetrated everywhere. It also turned out that Sam loved to read, and Leslie, as soon as the first edition came out, gave him that very book on history. He told Leslie that where he came from in Alaska, hunters sometimes saw them too. As time went on, Sam's gloomy, gloomy view of the world began to bother Leslie. She stopped sympathizing with him so much. His attitude no longer seemed to her the temperament of an unrecognized genius. She was ready to break up with him, but she found out she was pregnant. She told him about it. Sam was furious. He cursed her, accused her of lying to him about wanting to tie him down like that. But then he seemed to soften, started talking about maybe he'd admit to having a baby, as long as it wasn't a girl, because women in their family were always born on bad luck. And then he disappeared somewhere. Common acquaintances for all this time, they have not appeared and therefore Leslie had no idea where to look for Sam. Meanwhile, it became clear that the pregnancy is going hard. Doctors said that it was all about the individual characteristics of the body, 
and advised to rest as much as possible. In the end, Leslie felt so bad that she realized she could not stay, finish her studies, and even more so work. She decided to return to her hometown, where at least she had a sister and her home, and she also believed to the last that Sam would find her. He really appeared on the doorstep of the sister's house, but it was too late. Leslie was already gone. Max was six months old. Ariana wanted to send Sam away, but she remembered her sister saying that he was strange, unsociable and strange, but still a father to the child. But Ariana also feared that Sam would ruin the boy's life. So she made a strict condition that he could see him, but he would introduce himself to Max and everyone around him as a very distant relative, and Max would learn the truth when he grew up. Sam was becoming more and more withdrawn. He agreed. Only he said the strangest things, that it was better this way, that it was good that the boy was born, that there would be someone to carry on his work, to pick up his destiny. Ariana didn't care about the man's vague plans. She didn't care that he thought he was raising an heir. Ariana had no doubt that she would not let Sam, as a clearly unworthy father, get too close to Max, whom she now considered the most important person in her life. Ariana was more interested in the practical side of the matter, that every visit Sam would hand her a certain amount of money for the child, that he would behave himself in her house, and that he would not become a close acquaintance of her and Max's entourage. When Max found out about everything, he did not get angry with his aunt. Her explanations were understandable to him, of course. She was protecting him. Of course, there was nothing to think about accepting into the family a person who did that to his mother. Auntie clearly enjoyed the scene when Max, who was a head taller than his father, cursed him and said he would never forgive him for his deception. Sam had cried then, begging his son to understand, mumbling that he couldn't be there for him, that this was just the way life had turned out. Max had refused to understand it. If you loved her, you wouldn't have done this. Do you think he would have liked it? What are you doing hanging around here, wanting something from me? Shouted Max in his father's face. I'm still coming here. You're my blood. You'll realize that one day, said Sam. Please, Max said snidely. But I'm going to leave home on principle, do you hear me? I'll leave home on principle. I'll sleep at my friends or on the street with the homeless. Anything is better than under the same roof. He gave Sam a scornful look. A traitor. What do you know about betrayal? Sam answered. Nothing. I know enough, the boy shouted. He caught sight of an old toy, the wolf. He hadn't played with it in a long time, of course, but his aunt had put Sam's first gift on the shelf, next to the porcelain trinkets. I don't want anything from you. You're a stranger to me. Grabbing the toy, Max went to the stove, opened the damper, and threw it into the fire. In a flash, the flames embraced the old upholstery, greedily bit into the absorbent cotton. You're my breed, son, Sam replied, and looked at the boy strangely, very strangely. It's okay. In time, you and I will get it right, and you proved it to me today. Sam left. And since then, he didn't appear again. Max couldn't understand then for a long time, but his father's phrase stuck in his brain. What did he see in the fact that Max threw a toy into the fire? By evening, the planned amount of work was finished. Max barely managed to catch the last shuttle bus, but two stops before the house he got out of the cabin, despite the chilly autumn weather. It was too stuffy, and in general, it seemed that it was necessary to move to walk to drive out unnecessary thoughts from his head. He understood that he had to return home to his wife and daughter in a normal state. His family should not be worried about anything because of him. It was enough that they didn't know whose son he was. The darkness that covered the city had a calming effect. It seemed like a living, breathing creature whose soft velvet pelt cared for him, urging him to put aside his empty worries and look deep inside himself. With a short sob, Max pulled the scarf off his neck and quickened his steps. The last thing he wanted to do was look into his core 
and yet he couldn't not do it. Not now that he'd found out who he'd been married. Not now that he'd found out who he'd been married to all these years. Who he loved so much with all his heart. Max walked through the empty square deafeningly quiet at this late hour. He walked fast, almost ran, and angrily scattered leaves with his feet, and remembered when Sam hadn't come back in six months or a year, he'd been so relieved. He was so relieved that this man, who had the conscience to call himself his father, was finally out of the life that had room for Max and Aunt Ariana. But then... Four years later, Aunt Ariana said she had something to tell him, that there was news about Sam, and he should know about it. Sit down, Ariana asked. She was strangely pale, eyes glistening, crumpling an unfinished needlework napkin in her hands. Had something happened to Sam? Did he die? Ariana looked up, her face crinkled as if she were out to cry and scream at the same time. I wish he'd died when he was a boy she said stiffly, and then she blurted out all the truths she knew, and Ariana knew quite a bit. It so happened that one of the journalists who worked on the story about the crime of a maniac who was still in the press nicknamed Volkodov came to her childhood friend. His name was Harvey, and he was privy to the mystery of Mac's birth. He had contacted Ariana to tell her the truth about what a monster Sam had turned out to be. He advised Ariana on how to behave if one day someone else found out about it, although in principle, as he comforted her, it was unlikely. He told her that Sam was now likely to stay in a mental institution forever. Harvey also had very deep access to the whole case through his channels and connections. He knew a lot more than the press was letting on. He told what was the essence of Sam's madness. Harvey told Ariana the assumption of a psychiatrist that Sam had long had problems with his head and his work as a guide, or rather his keen interest in dark stories, had helped to reveal it. Perhaps the childhood, many years of which Sam had spent at the camp of wolf hunters, had also had an effect. Experts said that he went mad gradually, and then suddenly, at one point, he started to see that werewolves were walking around. Then Sam decided he had to fight them the way his ancestors had fought wolves. And Sam also decided that the most dangerous werewolves are women. At the clinic, Sam had described the witch and werewolf trials in Bamberg to the psychiatrists with such fervor, and the fact that there were even four-year-old minions of evil among them, that it made the doctors sick to their stomachs. Sam decided that the most dangerous werewolves existed in medieval Europe and the descendants of those of them who escaped extermination did not lose their animal essence. They scattered around the world, and now it was his task and mission to find the creatures and destroy them. So he decided to kidnap, interrogate, and clean Angelica, and then her mother Sophia. When Max heard that his father was a maniac, he was shocked. Just as in a stupor fell into a stupor in Ariana, afraid that the guy in a moment will go mad for shock, whipped him on the cheeks, splashed the guy with ice water. Auntie, that's unnecessary. Max suddenly stopped. What's the matter with this man now? Surely he will never hurt anyone else. Max never said my father anymore. Just that man. Never even called him by his first name. Ariana assured the young man that everything was so over with Sam and his atrocities. Max nodded calmly. Then he could scratch those sordid pages out of his memory and move on with his life. Normally and even happily, Max said that he was certainly not the only person in the world to whom such truth about his family had been revealed, and that he did not intend to live with this burden all his life, because he is personally clean, and therefore has the right to a normal, peaceful future. Max stopped at the crosswalk. At this late hour, it seemed for some reason that the city seemed as if it had died out, although usually there was quite a lively traffic but now only rare cars were passing by. The man took a deep breath and exhaled, enjoying the way the cold, almost crisp from the approaching winter fills the air and then bursts out with a melting cloud, as if taking away with it the trembling tension and bad, dark premonition. He should be able to. He is calm. He will go on with his life as if nothing had happened. His beloved will know nothing. Never he would not let the vulgar ruin the life of their little family. 
Max was about to step forward, but then a sound attracted him. He had heard drunken voices before. It seemed that the young people were out in the park, probably some kids drinking what their parents didn't allow. But now behind their hoarse cackling there was a new sound, a quiet crying, like a dog whimpering in pain. Aunt Ariana had told Max when he had begged her to take home a cat that had been in pain in the yard. The cat had once been white, the boy had no doubt about that. He begged, pleaded, promised that he would study well, always obey and would not even ask for a single gift for the new year. But could he please take the cat? But Auntie was adamant. She said they didn't need such care. And she scolded Max for being too sensitive, crying like a girl. So you think it's better to be heartless to animals? Wiping away his tears, he asked his guardian angrily. If it causes problems, then yes, she answered and shrugged her shoulders. But sometimes children who are cruel to animals grow up to be maniacs, Max muttered under his breath. What? What did you say? Say it again. Ariana waved her hands. I don't want to hear such words in my house anymore. Where did you get that from? She clutched at her heart. Max shrugged his shoulders and went on strike, kept silent all evening and refused to eat dinner. And he heard it in one program, where there was a serious uncle, talking about how the atmosphere of childhood affects the formation of adult personality. Steeply turned around, Max went, then ran deep into the park. There it is. Three boys were standing, discussing something, and at their feet lay a creature. It seemed to be a puppy, but it was so dirty that neither color nor breed could be discerned. But Max didn't care about that now. Come on, quickly move away, he shouted the boys. He knew from personal experience that polite please be kind, and shame on you would not help with them. He was a head taller than these guys, much stronger at first sight, and that's why they, though they started to snap, but it seems that they were not set up to fight. Who are you? What do you want, uncle? Why don't you go? What's your bitch? The words came out, but Max ignored them. But he didn't ignore the light poke in the shoulder he received when he bent down to pick up the puppy. He straightened up sharply, like a spring. In one hand, the dog hanging helplessly. In the other, the collar of one of the boy's jackets. You want trouble? I'll give you trouble. And if you think to force three on one to run over, then do not worry, one by one, I will find and arrange such a life that will not show a little. Max was saying something else. It was strange, but in about ten minutes, when he was already sitting in the cabin of a hitchhiker, who was taking him and the puppy to the nearest 24, our veterinary clinic. He couldn't remember what he had said. Something evil, it seemed. Cruel, he threatened. Which then will not seem the same, but will be very, very bad, nightmarish. Guys, let's go. He's a total scumbag. Running his eyes around the deserted park around him, said one of the boys. They were really small about 14 to 16 years old by the looks of it. They'd really come here to hang out a bit, forgetting parental control. Talking about their own things, then one of them ran into a lethargic dog in the dark. It snapped at him. Didn't hurt it, no, but it got it for that. It snapped once at someone who was weak and pathetic, but now they didn't feel like the cool masters of the night streets anymore. Two of them thought that it was a stupid idea to leave home and hang around like that, and one of them swore to himself that when he got home, he would confess to his father everything he had been doing for the last month, and whatever would happen. What happened? The driver brought Max out of his stupor. The dog, as I understand, is not yours, not mine, answered the passenger and looked at the animal, which was fiddling continuing to dirty clothes and looked with hopeful eyes shining like a gate stones. Foundling, so the driver nodded. My wife and I also found a cat like that. Neighbors at the dacha abandoned it in the fall and we picked it up. Oh well, and now she gives us heat. A queen no other way. Feed her, play with her, but never pet her. 
she whips you with her paw. But we love her, she's a member of the family. Here we are. The car slowed down near the building, over one of the entrances of which was burning sign Zolucker. 24 hours a day. Good luck. Thank you, Max replied, and went into his pocket for the money. No, you offend. The driver waved away. Good deeds do not require payment in karma. Plusicom fly. Don't get sick. Having seen off the departing car with a thoughtful look, Max went up to the porch and pulled the door on himself. This evening was strange. While the vet examined the dog, Max dropped the calls from his wife several times and only sent a text message. Everything is fine. Urgent business. I'll be home soon. Not that he thought Angelica would mind such an unexpected house guest, but just somehow he wasn't ready to talk to her right now. He just felt that he needed more time to calm down. But at least he didn't think that as soon as he was face to face with his wife, he would scream. Darling, I have something to tell you. I'm the son of a maniac, the same psycho. Yes, yes, who tormented you. I'm sorry, I always knew I was spoiled and maybe even a maniac at heart. It's a bull terrier, the vet informed me when the initial manipulations of examining the critter were done. It's a couple months old at most. Canine. No serious injuries, but his left leg is bruised. He will limp a bit. He's also very malnourished. We need to fatten him up. Feed, by the way. You can buy in our pet stores all closed already. Do you plan to keep it for yourself? After waiting, but not waiting for an answer, the doctor shook her head and sighed. Everything with this man was clear. He took pity on a dog child, and now, when the first emotions have subsided, he does not know what to do next. You can post ads looking for old or new owners, but be aware that no one decent may not respond. Especially the breed is so... What breed? Max didn't understand. Actually, a very good breed, smiled veterinarian. She was young, just graduated from high school, and for each of her patients worried with all her heart. Unfortunately, many people are afraid of bull terriers. There are so many myths about how dangerous they are. All kinds of prejudices. But in fact, it's a wonderful breed, and this little guy will grow up to someone good, loyal friend and protector. I see, said Max. Let's have your food. What a beach. Or is it just something that happened to him? He's cute. Mysterious. The vet thought and finally handed Max a list of the best things to feed the puppy. What vitamins to give when to bring him for his first vaccination. She had a gut feeling that this man would eventually keep the tiny bull terrier for himself. Where have you been? Angelica, who opened the door, didn't know what to think about her husband's strange behavior. He got off scantily with a text message returned at night, but immediately the woman gasped when she saw the puppy in his arms. The washed baby was wrapped in a blanket for warmth and now looked out of it with a snow, white face with a black ear, whimpering softly. Oh, 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 what is it with you? We're from? A long story, sighed Max, and handed his wife a bundle trembling from the storm of adventures experienced during the evening. I couldn't leave it. You are not allergic to animals, are you? I never have. Then, I guess he has nowhere to go but to stay with us. Well, at least for a while. Then we'll look for owners. He looked away from his wife. She understood it in her own way. Max, what are you, like a little boy? Bring a tiger into the house. You know I'm with you. I'll be your accomplice. That's good. The man was finally able to pull himself together, finding himself in the light, familiar coziness of his native home. He as if managed to leave aside all those bad thoughts which were digging their claws into him before. Max took off his shoes, took off his outer clothes. They went into the kitchen. The puppy needed to be fed, and then they had to make a place for him. Suddenly the bell rang in the hallway. Angelica looked guiltily at her husband. Angelica was back. 
She was going to be so happy about the puppy. Wait. Sarah was still walking. Well, you were late too. I'm different. She's a troubled teenager. Honey, let's not quarrel on a night like this, shall we? Angelica said pathetically, rushing to open the door. Look what a hero, Daddy, you are. You saved the dog. Max himself would like very much not to freak out now. But his daughter, standing on the doorstep in the company of her, as she said, best friend in the world, left him no chance. What did I tell you? Max shouted and dragged his daughter into the hallway by the hand. Sarah, exclaiming in protest, pushed him away. Where? Her father stepped in front of her. Let me go. The daughter threw back her head, flashed her thickly lined eyes, like those of an ancient Egyptian woman. If I'm not welcome here, I'm going to Richard's for the night. Sarah, don't start. Hey, said the boy who had kept silent outside her friend's house, shoving his hands into the pockets of his jeans, which were tight, worn, and covered with chains and patches. Richard looked guilty. Sorry, we went to the waterfront to look at the ships. It's all right. Then we had tea at my house. Grandpa will confirm. I know I promised you, he looked at Angelique, that I would bring your daughter at Nine. But then Grandfather was not good with his heart. We waited for an ambulance. Then I could not leave him alone. And it was not safe for her to go alone. Angelica put her hand on her husband's shoulder. She realized that she had done very badly. After all, they agreed that Sarah should think about her studies and not go out with her dubious friend. But when her daughter cried in the morning, she began to say that her own mother did not believe her, that they were just good friends with Richard. Just because he has a style doesn't mean anything. Just because he's into vampires and he listens to music like that. It's rock. Through tears, my daughter explained. A brand new direction. Maybe he'll become a star and everyone will envy him. Maybe he will become a millionaire and everyone will run after him. Honey, patiently repeated Angelica. I understand. You like him. Ah, Mom. Sarah stopped crying. What kind of love? Richard is my friend. He's the only guy who really understands me. He doesn't just see me as a girl. I'm his soulmate, and we're gonna be together, no matter what anyone says. Okay. Angelica was very glad that all this conversation took place when her husband had already left for work. Max, in principle, was not a tyrant father, but he would not tolerate such impertinent speeches from his daughter. Go out tonight. Just come home on time. And better yet, before your dad gets home from work, okay? Sarah, go to your room, said Max, who was in no mood for dialogue this evening. Dad, the puppy looked out from the hall where he had a bed under the table, and growled softly. He didn't like the noise and loud voices. Where did the dog come from? Sarah was confused. Mom? Dad? Your dad brought it, Angelica said hurriedly. He rescued the baby and brought it to us. Here for now, it will live here. You see, daughter, your dad is not a ruthless scarecrow. He is a good man, and you should. I'm a ruthless scarecrow. Max rounded his eyes. Angelica moaned softly and rolled her eyes. The words that Sarah had used to call her father that morning. You know, I think I'm going to go, Richard coughed. I'm sorry. I really didn't mean for it to happen like this. Dismissed. Max waved him away. He closed, or rather slammed, the front door. He turned to his daughter. His eyes were glowing very unkindly. So you already know what I'm like. Well... I won't disappoint you. As of today, you're grounded. Back to school and straight back. No walking. You'll learn from me how a ruthless scarecrow behaved. For a few moments, father and daughter struggled with their gazes. Then Sarah sobbed, covered her mouth with her palm, shook her head. I hate it, and rushed to her room. The puppy completely agitated by what was happening, rushed after her 
jumped up on his hind legs and began to scratch at the door with his front ones. The door opened and Sara let the dog in. We'll have dinner here. Angelica turned to her husband and waved her hands. For dinner, by the way, your favorite cutlets. Bon appetite to our family. He waited. He knew how to wait. And although there were moments when it seemed unbearable, he also knew how to find pleasure in it. Anticipation of what was yet to come. How many times had he denied himself that? It seemed like an eternity had passed. He had become a different person. He had to be. Otherwise, he would not have been able to fulfill his destiny. He made his choice the day the mental hospital orderly suddenly admitted he was a big fan. Sam didn't think he could have any fans at all. Well, really, he didn't think he deserved any praise because he was just doing his duty. He wanted to cleanse the world of filthy creatures. But he found himself flattered by it. He felt a shameful, sharp pleasure as the cold, sweaty palm of the orderly, strangely small, as if he had stopped growing as a child, shook sluggishly his palm, firm and calloused. Sam had forgotten the name of the orderly. It didn't matter. What mattered was that he'd offered to help, saying he'd find the keys and help him get out. But Sam, though he'd agreed to the original plan, had finally decided it would be different. He's the one who set the fire in the clinic. He's the one who had the orderly retrieve the body of a homeless man, which was eventually mistaken for a patient's body. The orderly was a fool, by the way. Kept talking about how they were going to be werewolf fighters together. Huh, Sam still chuckled, remembering the look on his face when the stupid fool realized that he didn't need a partner to be a real hunter. He'd just gotten rid of the orderly, and then he'd lurked, lay low. Dissolved among those whom the townspeople, those well-fed, drowned in their prosperity idiots, do not consider as people. Weeks spent among the homeless Sam now remembered even with warmth how much he had learned about human vices. He had listened to so many stories. He had witnessed so many tragic outcomes, and sometimes he had been the cause of them. Yes, he allowed himself to indulge a little, but only to get back in shape. Sam always knew that the biggest challenge of his life was yet to come. He'd waited a long time. He'd searched. Sometimes he even despaired when he thought he'd lost it. But then he calmed himself. Hunter's instinct does not go away, no matter how many years passed. And finally he found out everything. And again there was a reason to laugh. What is this but a sign of fate? The one who had so brazenly dared to elude him was living with his son. And they had a baby girl. Sam saw that as a sign, too. He was now grateful to his past for all the trials that had hardened his mind and spirit. Now there was only a little patience left. The Count was already counting down to hours. Sarah, as she had threatened, ate dinner in her room. Angelica took breakfast there as well. Max grumbled from the morning. What an outrage. How long will his daughter, a grown-up girl, be doing silly things? Give her time. Everything will pass. Children at this age are very emotional. Patiently turned to her husband, Angelica, and soothingly stroked the back between the shoulder blades. Max grinned, but stopped resenting out loud. Besides, he had to run to work. He didn't want to give him into any hands at all, so he decided to look for an owner for him among his co-workers. Sarah walked to school with her head down. The sky seemed quite low because of the grey clouds which heralded the imminent inclement weather. The day before, the young girl had been completely out of homework and her mood had soured because Betty, the English teacher, couldn't stand those who took her subject lightly. Sarah didn't notice how she had turned into the garages, but her legs had taken her along one of the familiar routes. In general, she considered herself too old to walk here because, well, what interesting can be there where there are just piles of iron? It is better to walk past the colorful store windows, listening to her favorite music in her headphones and fantasizing about the wonderful life that would begin when she grew up. But today's mood made her turn to the garages. 
It was as deserted and quiet as ever. Sarah grinned and turned up the volume on the player, remembering how her mom used to scare her when she was a kid, that it was dangerous to walk here. Of course, Sarah was walking, dancing and singing along to the lead singer of a rock band, shouting to the whole world about how lonely the heart is without love. She didn't immediately pay attention to the shadow, a silhouette slipping behind a row of tightly adjoining garages. And then suddenly Sarah almost tripped over a man lying on the ground. Help, he whispered and waved his hand, the other pressed to his chest. Ouch! The girl bounced half a step away and squeaked suspiciously, pulled out her headphones and crouched down. Do you need help? She didn't like this stranger at once, but he didn't look like a bum. Clean, shaven, shabby clothes, but neat. Should I pass him by? That's what I wanted more than anything. It was as if someone invisible was pushing him in the back and whispering, Go! Oh, or better yet, run! But Sarah also remembered how her mother taught her to be kind and sympathetic to people. And this place is not crowded, and if she runs away... What if this man dies? Heart, pills, in his pocket, mumbled the strange man. Sarah, overcome with squeamishness, for some reason, this elderly man caused disgust, some disgust, leaned towards him. She rummaged through the pockets of her outer clothing. Where's your medicine? Grandpa, let me call an ambulance. Sarah froze as the stranger's expression changed to one of triumph and anger. She didn't have time to do anything. He jerked up and towards her, knocking her down and immediately clamped his mouth over hers muffling her scream, and then... Sarah only had time to think that walking through garages, even in broad daylight, today in particular, was a very bad idea. And then... The world around her was swallowed up by darkness. Max leaned over the estimate, and it looked like everything was fine. The client was worried about the fact that suddenly discovered additional problem areas in the cottage will significantly raise the cost of the whole repair. But the chief of the firm assured that according to the contract it was already their concern, since they had previously calculated everything so. Now Max had to help reconcile all the calculations, and so far it came out in such a way that there was nothing to worry about. Work, as always, helped to forget, at least for a while, to get away from the agonizing decision to tell Angelica and her daughter the truth. And whether it is worth it at all to do. What, in fact, would it change? It would only alienate them. It would plant doubts in the hearts of his family. Maybe it would be better to continue lying. Although, was he all these years, until he knew the truth that was on her side? Was he lying? He just didn't tell everything. He's not his father's son at all. He despises him, hates him. So why ruin his reputation? Why spread the word about his parentage? His smartphone played a ringtone in his pocket. Max pressed accept on the touchscreen. Good afternoon. Max Stone, my name is Harvey. We met when we met. Hello, Max answered. Harvey. Yes, of course I remember. You used to come to our house on New Year's Eve. I haven't seen you in a while. Yes, business, replied Harvey. But here's the point. I need your time. It's really important. What's wrong? Max frowned. As you know, I'm a journalist. And I have some critical information for you. I know that you are Sam's son. Max froze. Coldness all over his body. It was like he was paralyzed. I've known about this since you were a child. Then when it happened, when Sam was caught, I gave everything I knew to Ariana. Don't worry. Please, I never had any intention of making any material out of your parentage. It's about something else now. You see, a few weeks ago, there was a fire in the clinic where Sam was being held. At first, they thought he died in it. But the body wasn't his. Your father escaped. And I'm afraid he did it for a reason. Max remained silent. He stood there and paid no attention to the fact that he was accidentally pushed by the shoulder of a worker carrying tools. He paid no attention to the fact that he was called by the chief. Max, your wife is in danger. I think Sam broke free with the sole purpose of finishing what he started. 
Max, are you listening to me? Yes, he said in a colorless voice. My wife. She doesn't know anything. She thinks he's locked up. And she doesn't know I'm his son. Oh, the journalist on the other end of the line is stumped. That certainly complicates things. I think it's only a matter of time before Sam is caught. It's unlikely that he'll adapt to reality so easily after so many years in the clinic. But I think your family needs to be careful. Can we meet? I'm in your city right now. I think I can be of help to you in my time. I've learned a lot about Sam, and I think I can understand his mind. I'll call you back. Max ended the call. His fingers did not listen well. He swore, once again giving the smartphone the wrong command, but finally called his wife. Five beeps, ten. Redial. Again. And again. Two hours before Harvey called Max, Angelica also received a message. Only hers was not live, or rather, it was a video recording. It came as the woman stood at the kitchen table, making pancake batter. Yes, her leg hurt. But Angelica did not consider it a reason to cancel the usual home-cooked menu. Her daughter did not answer the phone, although they usually called during the day. But Angelica calmed herself by thinking that Sarah had taken offense again. She must have decided to keep rebelling. She was probably sitting at her friend's house. Angelica decided that she would finish the pancakes and follow her because Richard lived in the same courtyard, in the house across the street, so it would be possible to waddle over somehow. Or maybe, Angelica thought, she should bring the pancakes with her. To treat Richard, his grandfather, and at the same time to get closer to her daughter, Angelica decided that there was no need for tough upbringing, just explain everything to Sarah. The message came from her daughter's number, and Angelica smiled her little kitten, apparently decided to make contact and stop sulking. That's a good girl. True sending video clips was not in her spirit, but who would understand today's youth? The surrounding reality went ringing cracks, filling with the tentacles of a nightmare rising from the oblivion of horror as the clip started. Hello, little shit. A creaky, changed, but still so recognizable voice. Camera captured the face of an elderly man. An old man, and Angelica instinctively raised her hand to her throat, as if right now the collar of the captive could close on it again. Well, almost, Sam chuckled, looking directly into the camera and licked his lips. I've been waiting a long time. A long time. I thought, what if I really am a fool out of my mind? But no, that's right, that's right, that's right. Look what I have here, eh? Your wolf cub, your filthy brat. The camera shuddered, shifting, and Angelica cried out as she saw her door. Sarah. The girl was lying on the concrete floor, her hands and feet bound, her mouth covered with some black cloth. You're screaming, aren't you? Sam grinned. Well, scream, scream. You know, animals, non-humans, they also, they say, take care of their offspring. That's what I thought. You won't stay in your hole while I cure your daughter of her vice, will you? Would you like to? He grinned and returned his face, distorted by madness to the cell. I'll let her go, eh? I'll make a deal. You'll come in her place. I'll tell you where. And if you decide to tell anyone to trick anyone, then if you decide to bring anyone with you, I'll decide with her at once. Understand? Listen where I'll be waiting for you. Don't take your phone with you, because I know you, Sly. You'll decide to drive back and call for help. And I don't want that. Don't cheat. Max, where are you going? The owner of the construction company called out perplexedly to his best employee. Max, what happened? But he, without answering, just ran out of the cottage got into the car and barely seeing what was happening on the road in front of him, headed home, not to wait for the elevator too long. On foot and up running, he dialed her more than once. No answer. Called his daughter the same thing. Opened the door with his own key. Sarah, Angelica, but only a puppy jumped out. The little one didn't like being alone and whimpered. 
Max picked up a piece of paper from the nightstand. A note, I love you, I'm sorry. He came for me, he wants me. I won't let him kill Sarah. I'm sorry. I love you, I'm sorry, Max froze. Then his eyes fell on his phone. Why had Angelica left it behind? And what was the meaning of all this? Where could she be? What do we do now? What's going on? Max took his wife's smartphone, started up the video. When Max heard a knock on the door, he opened it. Good evening. Richard was there. I'm sorry it's me again. It's just that we need to talk. Man to man, I'm a friend of Sarah's and you. What's wrong? The guy interrupted his prepared speech, counting the emotions on Max's face. My dad, Max said, and handed the guy his phone. He took her. Sarah and Angelica. What? Frowning. Richard took the phone. Sarah's grandfather? And I didn't know he even existed. Oh boy. Exclaimed the guy as the video started up. While he watched it, Max didn't say anything. I don't understand. Richard whispered confusedly, but immediately pulled himself together. Okay, we have to act. It's some kind of psycho, a maniac. He is a maniac, Max said in a muffled voice. He's come from my family. Now, Richard frowned. So, the video was sent an hour ago, so she should be there by now. But that's if it's the long way which everyone knows. And if it's a detour, what are you talking about? I know this place, Richard exclaimed. It's a sanatorium Grafskaya Zorka. Well, in the 90s it was a cool place, but now it's a derelict. Me and my boys once wandered. Do you know where it is? Max woke up. I'm coming. I'm coming with you. Don't even think about it, Max said, hurriedly taking the puppy and locking it in his daughter's room so the kid wouldn't tear up with them. My friend was kidnapped by a psychopath. Your wife rushed to save her. He says not to tell anyone and you think I'm going to stand by. No, you're not. We're going together right now. We're going together right now. We'll be there in 20 minutes. I know every way in and out of there, the guy waved his arms. We'll take that grandfather down in a heartbeat. In a couple of minutes, they both went downstairs and got into Max's car. And while we're driving, you tell me everything. Okay. I don't understand anything at all. Richard stretched out pitifully, but it was clear from his tone that he would never give up what he had decided to do. Max nodded and twisted the wheel, pulling out onto the road the boy had indicated. I'll tell you everything. I'm just dreaming. It's just a scary dream. And it's about to end. I'll wake up and everything will be fine. I will wake up and there in the normal real world next to me will be my beloved husband and in the next room sleeping daughter. Such simple, naive, saving thoughts flashed through Angelica's head while she got to the destination must be a thousand times. She wanted to weep and laugh at the same time, at what a fool she was and at the fact that it was probably her fault guilty from the very moment she had let herself be grabbed by that madman. And it didn't matter that she was just a baby then. Guilty from the moment when she thought that she, so spoiled by this nightmare, could have a normal, full life. No, and no, again. Angelica slapped the steering wheel in fury and nearly lost control. She should have realized that people like her were not supposed to have a normal family and a normal, happy human life. It was her fault. It was her fault for dragging Max into her personal hell. And Sarah, Angelica, sweet, gentle, beloved daughter. She didn't deserve this. Angelica wiped away the tears that had come to her eyes and had to keep her eyes on the road. She couldn't, just couldn't let anything happen to her child. The building of the former sanatorium was located almost on the very outskirts of the city, and according to the plans of some of the local businessmen, it could and should have been torn down one day to make way for a small residential complex with a reputation of elite due to the already developed architectural project, complementing it with new infrastructure, as well as, of course, the location in an ecologically clean place. But she stopped, got out of the car, and got out of the car. 
but the building was not the only one. She braked, got out, and ran to the main entrance. The massive, heavy door gave way reluctantly, and with a long, anxious creak, it would have been completely dark inside if it hadn't been for the cleanly blown-out windows on the first floor. Sarah! A woman screamed. Daughter! Sarah! Silence. Angelica froze, tensed. She froze, not knowing where to go, where to look. A rustle. She turned sharply, but it seemed to be just some bird flitting outside, disturbed by the man in his hiding place. Sarah! Sarah! Don't yell! came a voice from the top of the wide staircase leading to the second floor. Angelica raised her head, squinted. There, high up, stood Sam, illuminating himself with a flashlight. Where's my daughter? What did you do to her, you bastard? She's singing, he grinned. Your girl's alive. For now, the fear and terror that had gripped the woman on the way here had given way to other feelings. Now, in her very core, there was a single longing to save her daughter. To see Sarah and make sure she was all right. And then, they would make it. They'll get out of here. How? Somehow. Just because there's no other way. Angelica didn't say anything. Just nodded. She clenched her hands into fists and started slowly up the stairs. She was walking towards Sam the maniac, about whose condition the head doctor of the psychiatric clinic said that it was one of the most frightening and hopeless cases. His failed victim was walking towards him and was not afraid of him at all. We are idiots, Richard exclaimed, when we were almost there and the sanatorium loomed ahead. You and I. Well, what kind of superheroes? What about calling the police? That should have been the first thing to do. Max looked at the guy. He was right. How did this logical action slip his mind? He kept driving with one hand, and with the other he reached into his pocket for his cell phone. We're here, but I'm not waiting. There's no time. I won't just stand there and not go in. I can't. My wife and daughter are there. I agree, Richard nodded. They will get here as we are about the same time. And we are already here. Come on, outline the situation, and let's go. You stay here? Max looked at the guy sternly after he finished the call and they got out of the car. You're underage. Minor. You know, in a situation like this, I decide for myself, so shut up and listen. He was suddenly beside me and unceremoniously poked the man in the chest with his finger. Go around to the end of the building. There's an upstairs service entrance. Judging by the video, this is the hall where they used to give all sorts of concerts and lectures on healthy lifestyle. We'll get in undetected. So, I take it you have no weapons? No, Max shook his head. So we'll make do with what we have, sighed Richard, looking around for a stick. But I have pepper spray just in case I carry it. I'm a poor man's nightwalker. It hasn't come in handy yet, but I guess it's time. All right, let's go. Stay behind me and be quiet. When he must have been about three or four feet away, Sam turned his back on Angelica and headed down the hallway. The woman suppressed the urge to call out, to demand an answer to some question again. She just followed. Distantly, as if through a foggy, pain-like thoughts about the stupidity the absurdity of what was happening crept into her mind. What was she doing here all alone? Why didn't she call anyone for help? Why did his order to appear alone affect her so hypnotically? But her tormentor, the one whose evil had turned back on her after so many years, slipped through the ajar door. Trap! Angelica was pierced by this thought, but she did not give in to the prick of fear. She just followed her daughter. In this large room, apparently a former concert hall. Apparently a former concert hall, of course. It should have been dark, too. But it was lighted by a fire made of broken remnants of furniture laid out on the floor. And not far from it on the floor. Daughter! Angelica rushed past Sam to Sarah. She knelt down beside her and let the tears flow. Tugged at the ropes on her arms and legs. Tore off the cloth that cuff that covered her mouth and started slapping her cheeks. Mom, 
Mom, exclaimed the girl. Why? He stood a little apart, separated from them by the fire, and in its red glow Sam's face seemed inhuman, so twisted with anger, thirst for revenge, anticipation that at last everything would be to his will. It's all right, my girl. It's all right. Sarah, don't be afraid, baby. My girl Angelique whispered, nervously unraveling the ropes on her daughter's arms and legs. Finished with them. Get up, it's all right, sunshine. The girl could barely stand up. Her limbs were stiff from the tight ropes and long immobility. You have to let her go. Angelica turned to Sam. Mom, I'm not going anywhere without you. Mom, what's going on? Who's that? Mom, call the police. Where's Dad? Do you know who your dad is? Sam said suddenly. She has to go. You want me, don't you? Let my daughter go. I'll stay. And we'll talk. Talk. Sam grinned. Talk. You think I want that from you? You bitch. I wasn't done with you then, but now. You think I'm going to give up my purpose? You're just as dumb as you are. And your daughter's not going anywhere. The maniac began to walk slowly around the fire. On the side where the woman and the girl stood, there was no exit, only rows of armchairs broken halfway down and doors from the hall that were shut behind them. Mommy, I'm scared. Who is it? whispered Sarah. It's okay. It's going to be okay, Angelica replied, and put her arm around her daughter's shoulders, pulling her tightly against her. As I say, run. Run and don't look back. Don't stop. Bring help. I won't leave you, sobbed Sarah. He won't do anything to us, will he? Angelica didn't know what to say. What are the strengths of two people against one? Theoretically, they could be good, but Sam, despite his age and the fact that all these years spent in the clinic, was very strong, and in addition, in height and weight exceeded much. Get away, you bastard! came a sudden shout in the light of the flashlight danced around the room. Max and Richard had entered the room through an inconspicuous door and now found themselves between the prisoners and the madman. Max, Angelica exclaimed. Daddy, Richard, Sarah instantly perked up. The family was here. Nothing bad would happen to them, even if they didn't know what was going on, but nothing bad would happen to them. Yeah, finally, Sam grinned. I knew we'd be together someday, son. I knew I'd have a chance to show you the truth. What's he talking about? Sarah was confused. Max was pale, tense, but he stood up straight, facing the man he'd long ago stopped considering a loved one. Damn you, Max spat through his teeth. I wish you'd died in that fire. Uh, what? You want to hit me? Destroy you. Sam threw his arms out to his sides and stepped toward his son. It's the hunters calling you. We're not snotty men. We know how to hate and punish. Max, whispered Angelica. What is he talking about? Beloved, Max was painful to look at his wife. He was afraid. Now he was mortally afraid. But not of the madman, with whom, unfortunately, he was connected by biological origin, but of the fact that his wife could turn away from him now, having learned the truth. This man is my father. I found out what he was like. Too late. I disowned him, I swear. I didn't mean to. I couldn't tell you that. Especially when I found out. You don't get away from your kind that easily. Sam hissed, unhappy that he wasn't the one paying attention right now. The appearance of new faces, in addition to the fugitive victim and her daughter, was an unpleasant surprise for him. Although in principle, he was ready to accept the fact that his son would find out everything now and here, and not later. Perhaps Sam thought it would be even better. No, Angelica shook her head. That's not true. It is, Max replied. I didn't know how to say it, so as not to lose your love. Angelica, you're the most precious thing in the world that I have. You and Sarah, I love you, and that's all. It doesn't matter. I didn't know how to say it. I was afraid that this, 
Madness is hereditary. It was very hard to talk about it, but I went on. I saw a psychiatrist, told him everything, and he tested me. He said there was nothing wrong with me, that I had no signs of schizophrenia and the insanity that is. Max couldn't call Sam his father, which this man has. Sarah, are you okay? Richard, who had been standing off to the side, finally spoke. Walking up to the mother and daughter, he took the girl's hand. Don't be afraid. We've already called for help. They'll be here any minute. Suddenly, laughter cut through the silence. It was Sam. Sam was laughing, holding his stomach, his face red, his eyes running from side to side like a broken doll. Can't you see? He turned to his son and spoke. He spoke of how special this night was. The full moon is shining, and Max, as a descendant of the great hunters, only needed to learn to look. He only needed to look more closely and he would notice. Did he not see how crooked, too big and strange for a man, his wife's shadow was? The beastly tail and ears, the elongated face of a werewolf. Can't he see his daughter's eyes glowing yellow in the darkness? Sam spoke quickly occasionally breaking into laughter. He was urging his son to open his eyes. How could he be so stupid that he couldn't see that he was living with werewolves? It's nothing, my son. It seems that our gift has waned on you. It's a misfortune, of course. It's nothing. Sam suddenly pulled his weapon out of its sheath. Sarah cried out. Richard covered her and Angelica with his own. Take it! finish the damn brat. You're my son. Sam was yelling so loud his voice was getting hoarse. You're not my father, Max answered. You're not his father, Angelica said. He's my husband and the man I love. He's my family. She suddenly realized that for her all this kinship between Max and the maniac who had ruined her life has no meaning. Her Max is the best in the world the most dear and dear man. He's my daddy, Sarah joined her. I don't need a grandfather like that. You're crazy. You belong in an insane asylum. Max is a normal man, Richard added. Yes, a difficult character, but a normal man with a soul. And you, the guy spat contemptuously in Sam's direction. You're a crazy lunatic. If it were up to me, I'd have you. No. Max looked at the boy carefully. You don't have to. Yes, that man deserves to be punished. But you don't have to want it. Don't let him change you. You know, I should apologize. Right here and now. I was rude to you when I said you weren't the right friend for Sarah. You went off on me without knowing what was ahead. You're a good guy and don't let evil infect you. It's not going to get us, our family. Sam looked at the people on the other side of the fire and couldn't believe what he was seeing. He had lived all these years thinking that one day he would meet his son, and it would be enough. Surely it would be just enough to point him to the truth, to the natural nature of things, so that he too would have that precious sight opened up. And now... Sam was shocked. Spoiled, Sam spat out. You're spoiled. She cast a spell on you, you bitch. Well, that's all right. I'm with everyone now. He was about to throw himself at the people in front of him. But then the siren sounded. Sam froze. And then his face twisted even more than before, and he ran. Suddenly, he was scared, terrified. He couldn't imagine being in a cage again, in a place where no one trusted him. But Sam... The maniac who had spent half his life waiting to get even with his rescued victim, to find a partner in the werewolf hunt in his son, was caught before he left the abandoned sanatorium. And the new day was hectic, complicated, tiring. Angelica, only when it became clear everything was safe, only when Sam was in custody, only when Sam was in custody, only then realized how wildly her leg hurt. And before that, she had stepped on it without feeling the wound. The doctor who examined her after all that had happened said that it was the nervous system that activated the hidden resources of the body. 
because simply in those moments she, as a mother, wanted to save her daughter more than anything else in the world. Richard was praised and scolded for his courage and for throwing himself so recklessly into the almost destroyed building where the maniac was. His grandfather, of course, had to be told the truth, but carefully and gently, so that his heart wouldn't go bad again. The next day, when the formalities were over, Max, Angelica, and Sarah met Harvey. I told you I was in town. Why didn't you call me? The man said indignantly. Despite his years, he was still on the staff of the newspaper and looked young and alert. Harvey insisted that it would be difficult to feel normal without a good coffee after such a story. The Stoney family agreed, especially since they had already had time to stop by the house to feed and walk the puppy. It slipped my mind and I sincerely apologize, Max replied. Well, never mind, sighed Harvey. It's going to be a big story. I wouldn't want that, Angelica said. Is there anything we can do to keep us out of harm's way? I can't have journalists ruining our lives. They'd have to. I understand, Harvey nodded. Unfortunately, we can hardly escape the attention of the press entirely. But I can advise you to just ignore them. And of course, I promise not to write any compromising details about you. Do you think Sam won't run away again? Sarah asked quietly. No, I think that's the end of it for him, replied Harvey. Angelica had a hard time accepting this reality. She knew she had more than one night of nightmare ahead of her. But she had no doubt that her feelings for her husband would remain the same and even grow stronger. His origins really had no dark significance to her. Aunt Ariana was shocked when she found out, and she was also hysterical, feeling immensely guilty for having kept silent all these years about what kind of man was in their family. It had taken Angelica a great deal of effort to convince this kind woman, who had accepted her as her own from the beginning, that it didn't matter. Harvey, by the way, had also visited Ariana, and even, in a sort of half-joking way, explaining awkwardly that, for this of course is not the best time, but it is necessary as something to distract from bad thoughts, invited her on a date. There would be no happiness, sighed Angelica, when one evening Ariana called to share the impressions she and Harvey went to the theater. How are you? Max asked. Fine, replied his wife. They sat in the living room on the couch. Max looked through the documents taken from work. The chief, of course, entered into the situation, but from the duties could not be released at all. The puppy was snoring and shuffling in his sleep, nestled cozily on Angelica's lap. About a week after all the events, Richard appeared on the doorstep of the Stone's apartment. The guy was hard to recognize his usual outfit in black colors. He changed to the most ordinary blue jeans and a plaid shirt, and also from his ears disappeared earring, and he cut his hair. Why are you so dressed up, Sarah asked her friend, whom Richard had stopped by to invite for a walk, to which now the girl went with the approval of mom and dad. I just wanted to change something, Richard answered. I'm bored with gloomy things, especially after everything. I don't think I'm attracted to gloomy things anymore. You're going to be boring, Sarah said, buttoning her boots. No way. I'm cool anyway, Richard replied in her tone. Okay, cool, Max patted the boy on the shoulder. I want to be home together by seven. My wife is baking a plum cake, so that's a good motivation, smiled the guy, taking Sarah under his arm. Well, we're off. Bye. Another week later, Harvey called again with big news. He said that Sam had passed away. His mental state had worsened considerably since returning to the clinic. Now he was seeing werewolves and doctors and neighboring patients and he had died of a heart attack. How are you? Angelica asked her husband cautiously when the conversation with Harvey was over. I don't know, he answered honestly. On the one hand, I should be glad because now he will never hurt anyone again. But I also, honey, I feel like such a jerk because I feel sorry for him. Angelica just waited silently for her husband to say something. I'm sorry that he went crazy one day. I'll probably still be thinking about whether he could have been a normal, ordinary father and grandfather. Or was it... Was it destined for him from the beginning? Was he always sick? I don't know. I'm completely confused. I don't know how I can help you, 
Angelique hugged her spouse. I can only say that I'm by your side and I love you very much. And it's not your fault. He became like this. Long time ago. And how things might have been. We'll never know. But maybe... Is it time to let go of the past? To keep it real? Just us, our family? You're right, Max smiled. Let's live in the present. We have so much to worry about, especially like what to do with him. He nodded at the puppy who was nibbling on his tummy on the floor, chewing on a slipper. Somehow I got carried away and didn't find any owners for him, and he's growing up. Maybe the owners have already found them, Angelica said timidly. Max understood the hint. He bent down and kissed his wife on the nose. You're right. Here, now we have a dog. All that's left is to think of a name for him. Sarah will probably want to name it after some superhero from the comics. There she has a new issue that she reads. Came out, then we'll leave it up to her, Max said. Personally, I'm used to calling him just a dog. Hey, dog, want a snack? The puppy left his slipper, jumped up, wagged his tail, yelped and ran into the kitchen. <laughs> 